I want to go over some of the parts of the homework. Uh, the TA, one of the TAs sent hints to a section. I don't think those hints went to everybody. I don't know if those hints were helpful or not. The TA asked me, well, what's the rule with hints? When do we give hints? What don't, what's the basic policy? And I will tell you what the philosophy is, which is I've been to lots of uh, lectures and, and read things about the nature of education and how students are learned and the education system is broken now and so on. And my extraction from all of that is that how much you learn is just directly correlated with how much time you spend thinking hard. It's not correlated with how much time you spend grinding through uh, homework problems, uh, how much time you spend reading the book, it's how much time you spend banging your head against the wall trying to solve problems. So I would say the thing which I most want to get out of this class, want you to get out of this class, is, 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 is spending that time. And there are lots of aspects to that. Like I'd like you to start to, if you're not used to it, I'd like you to start enjoying it. So that, that feeling of, hey, you, you did, why are you asking us to do this? You didn't tell us how to do this. I want you to feel like the opposite of that. Hey, you didn't tell us how to do this. This is fun. This is a real question. And that's, you know, your success in life is going to be based on your ability to answer questions that the person who asks you does not know the answer to. And so it's, it's uh, practicing uh, problems that somebody did not tell you exactly how to solve them is what you most want to do. Now, if you are absolutely, totally, completely lost, it's not fun. But the more lost you can be and still be engaged, sort of the better the, the, better the process is. So that, that you struggled with these problems, at least some of you did, was the intent. They weren't meant to be like straightforward uh, problems from uh, from recipes that I taught you in lecture. Uh, but maybe some of you didn't struggle. Anyway, I want to go over some of the key aspects of the problem. So one of them is straight out of the lecture. Uh, I gave a lecture on hydrostatics and part of the lecture was a little fast. My ESP uh, sensors told me that you didn't quite follow the lecture, so I wanted you to go back and reproduce it yourself. And now my email sensors tell me that at least some of you even with that, couldn't get it. So I just want to go over part of the lecture. So this is, so to start with, is just this, a little bit of review of um, Archimedes. So I'm going to do, do for you uh, part of the homework which was due today. And, it, and it's also doing, again, what I did in lecture, but I did in lecture perhaps uh, too fast. So let's just say that we're given, uh, let's just start out with rho is equal to a constant. And therefore, gamma, which is rho g, is going to be a constant, a different constant. And we know uh, other things. So I'm not going to go through all of the reasoning. We know, for example, that the pressure at a given height is uh, rho uh, g h, where h is the distance from the top of the surface. And we'll assume that the pressure at the top of the surface is zero. Now, the pressure at the top of the surface in real engineering is not zero. It's atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is, in fact, not negligible. It's much bigger than the pressure difference going down to here. But how you deal with that constant is something you can think about. Or we could just say it's a constant and it subtracts out. We also had, uh, related to this, is that pressure is only a function of z. Two places that are horizontally separate from each other have the same pressure, necessarily. Now, the actual more general derivation here was that the pressure was the integral of the density of the fluid going straight up above the point of interest. And we got that by drawing a free body diagram of a small cylinder. If you take that the pressure is, comes from the weight of the fluid, or the pressure times a little bit of area is the weight of the fluid in a prism with that cross-sectional area, take that together with this it tells us that the density in the fluid can only be a function of z also. Because if the density of the fluid varied in a horizontal way, then we could have two different columns, which would have two different weights above them, and they'd have two different pressures at the same height. So we also have that if rho is equal to rho of z, but not rho of x or y. We're now um, using the notation that z is up and x and y are two horizontal directions. OK, we have that. We also have uh, this result that if we're looking at just a little bit of surface on some thing like this, that the force on this little bit of surface 
and I could call this delta f as a vector is equal to the force on that little surface. Well, if there's an outward vector here, I'll call it n, a unit vector, which is orthogonal to the surface. This delta f, the force on that little bit of surface, is proportional to the area of that little surface, and it's proportional to the pressure, and it's in the direction of n, but n points out, so it's in the minus n direction. So here's this idea that there's no shear force, and that the pr pressure-like thing is smooth, therefore the force is proportional to the area, and it's, and it's normal to the area, so we get this uh, result, that the force of a st static fluid on any surface is proportional to the area, proportional to the pressure, pr pressure and directed inwards on the surface, uh, exactly orthogonal. Okay, so we're given all that, and then you had this puzzle problem, which is, what's the buoyant force on some thing? So we had this thing, and what we want to know is when we add up all these pressure forces, what do they add up to? And the result, Archimedes' principle, is that all these pressure forces, if we add up all these forces all the way over the surface, they add up to the weight of the fluid which would have been there. Now, is the weight of the fluid which have been there a well-defined thing? Yes, it is, because this fluid here has some density. Therefore, the fluid that would have been here has to have the same density because the density cannot depend on x or y because if it did, then pressure would depend on x and y and that can't happen for things to be in equilibrium. Otherwise, little horizontal cylinders would pop to one side or another. They wouldn't be still. Okay, any question about any of that reasoning so far? Yes? Say again? Little n is a unit vector. Uh, perpendicular to the surface. So the normal force is this one, and then this tells you the direction of the force, this tells you the magnitude of the force, or the scalar multiple. We can't really say magnitude because it's a negative number. So scalar multiple of the unit direction vector. Okay, other questions? Uh, N is a, is a geometric quantity which has nothing to do with forces. So if we have a surface here, for any surface we can draw a vector which is perpendicular to that surface pointing out, and we can find a unit vector in that direction, and that's what N is. It happens to be in the direction of the action-reaction vector, but that's not the way we're thinking of it here. Because we're not using action and reaction at all, we're just looking at the force on the surface. Does that address your question? Okay. Yeah. How many people like that other people ask questions? Raise your hand. Okay, therefore, you'll be doing a service to society because society needs engineers. Engineers have to be educated. This group of people is going to be engineers, so by serving this class, you're serving society. People in this class will be happy if you ask a question. So ask a question. <laughs> Who wants me to move on? Who wants somebody else to ask a question? Actually, I got a question. Yes, please. Can a buoyant force, a buoyant force goes up, right? Mm -hmm. Can a buoyant force also go down? Yes. Like, would that apply to the milk and oil thing that we just did? Well, it applies to trying to, my, my trying to trick you with the milk and oil thing we just did. It, uh, now, how does a buoyant force go down? It goes down if gravity force goes up. <laughs> the buoyant force is always opposite the gravity force, so long as you're dealing with positive density fluids. If you could imagine negative density fluids, buoyant force could go down. Yes? But we don't know that yet. We, we can calculate that, right? We'll find out. Yes? Okay, this symbol is upside down L, which is called gamma. Gamma. Greek alphabet, so far we have rho and gamma, and this is not P, and this is not L. Rho, gamma. Yes? Say again?
Well, we, we, we don't know. I know that because it's Archimedes principle and I learned it in fourth grade just like you did. But how do I figure that out? That's the homework problem. I showed it in lecture and I'm about to show it to you again now. Say again? That you thought that was given. Now there's, there's, a, there's a whole other different reasoning that gives the same answer, which many of you probably know, and I'll say that again. But this is a, sort of, this is a more uh, technical algebraic approach. Any other questions? Okay, so now we want to figure out what the total force is on this thing. And not the total force, because the total force includes gravity acting on this piece of wood or boat or ice cube or whatever it is. And it also includes the force of some string, which is holding it underwater, say, or rod, which is holding it up, because this is submerged and static. So let's say totally submerged. But we're just looking at the buoyant force. Now to figure it out, the buoyant force is this force plus this force plus this force plus this, and we want to add them all up. But these are not individual things, they're little bits. There's a little bit on this area, a little bit on this area. And so this adding up of little things, or little and littler things, or things which are proportional to the area, is a, is a Riemann sum. It's an integral. So we've got to do an integral, which is adding up all these forces. And if you like, it's an integral that belongs in multivariable calculus. What, why am I doing that? We're in Math 191. Well, this is a bit of multivariable calculus that you can understand. We're adding up a vector quantity over a surface, but it's still just addition. How do you do addition? You break it up into little pieces, and you, and you think about how they all add up. So that's what we want to do. So if we want to add up all these forces, one way to add them up is we take and we draw a prism like this, and we look at on this prism, what is the sum of the pressure forces on this prism? And if we can get a formula for that, then we can do another prism and another prism, and we can take this whole thing and imagine we have a big French fry cutter, and we took, you know, French fry cutters, this is like grid of knives like this, and we've took this potato and we go shh, cut through, we have all these potato French fries here, and if we can figure out the force on each of the French fries, and then add up over all the french fries, that will tell us the total force on this thing. Okay, so now the trick is, is we're going to figure out that these two forces here are the same as the weight, not of the french fry, but of the water that would have been here. If that's true, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and I did show you last week, and some of you succeeded in doing on the homework, then the sum of these two forces is the sum is the weight of the water that would have been in here, not the weight of the potato. And the same for this French fry and so on. So the sum of the forces on the boundaries of all the French fries, which is the sum, some of the French fries are those weird ones at the end that little kids don't like because they're sort of burnt and stuff like that, but we're counting those too. The sum of all the forces in the boundary of the French fries is then the sum of the weight of all of the water which it would take to fill up the French fries. And that's the result. So that means the big hard step in this calculation is to show that these pressure forces here add up to the weight of the water which would have been in here. Once we got that, then we've got Archimedes' principle. Is that clear? Yes? I understand the mathematics part. I did the integral. But my question is more general. I'd like to that point first only working up. So how can we add the ones that are not working up? Because I think that's Okay, so the net buoyant force on this whole thing turns out to be up but the pressure forces push all directions. In fact, that's the first thing that people say that I made fun of at the lecture is that pressure acts in all directions, right? And it's true, pressure, whatever pressure is, a scale or a tensor, shows itself as a vector which acts perpendicular to every surface no matter what the orientation of the surface. Does that address your question? Yes? A tensor is a thing, mathematical object, which, when you feed it a vector, it tells you another vector. So in this case, the tensor representing water pressure is a thing that when we feed it the normal to a surface, it tells us the force per unit area on the surface. Now, could you really understand what I just said? No, you can't. But it, it's, early, it's, it's early in your career. You can remember the words, and then later on, if you learn tensors, you can think back and say, oh, Professor Rina told us, now I get it. Okay. I actually remember asking the same question was I about your age, and I remember the professor answering something like I just answered, and I sort of went, 
what? But then I, I, I still remember, and it just made sense what he said when I think back. Okay. <clears throat> so, so now we need to figure out if we're going to derive Archimedes' principle that the pressure force here plus the pressure force here is equal to the weight of water which would fill this French fry. Okay. So what we do is we draw, and I can call this, say, a partial free body diagram because a real free body diagram has to show all the forces on something. So here we have this French fry, and I'll draw it a little bit exaggerated. And then it's got this some bottom surface here, which might, which might be visible to us or might not be visible to us. Depends, I'll try to make it visible to us. <laughs> Good luck with that. Oh, well, okay, I can't do it. <laughs> There's some bottom. Anybody can do it, they're welcome to come up here and draw it for me. I can't figure out how to orient that thing. To, what? I could draw the same shape. And <laughs> getting closer. No, I don't know what that is. Okay, whatever. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then one more line. One more. One more line. I happen to know that three quarters of those of you who are laughing can't do any better. So. <laughs> Uh, so here we have this french fry. We want to figure out the forces on this french fry. Now, what's tough about this is that this surface is crooked. And that's the part of the calculation I did very quickly last time. And that's the, hard, that's the part I wanted you to fester on uh, this time. So what we have is we have some force here. I can call this delta F2. And we have some force here on this surface. And I don't know whether you can see it. It looks like it's a hidden first force here. And I'll call this delta F1. And we have over here, and now I'll try to be consistent with what I had over there. Z is up today. Uh, so we have here a Z2 and a Z1. And what we want to figure out is not just the total of these forces, but the vertical part. Now these forces are not vertical, and in fact when you go back and look on these things, these forces are in all directions, and so there is a sideways force acting on this or there are lots of sideways forces, it happens that those all add to zero. And that's another calculation we could do, but we kind of did that one already. Right now we're interested in the vertical forces. The sideways forces somehow, by the magic of, of the way pressure forces work, add to zero, and you can think about that as a side problem, but I'm not going to do that now. Okay, so all we're interested in is the vertical forces. So what we want to look at is the vertical part of this force and the vertical part of this force. Now, here's, here is the trick. Here is this French fry, which in the end we thought of as be, we're going to take the limit as the French fry size goes to zero, and we're doing calculus, so we're thinking of this as a very narrow French fry and so on. But then uh, something which is a really common problem is that you take things that are small, you draw them fall, you think of them as small, and you shrink your confusion into a little dot where you can't untangle it. So now we've got this little thing, and what we're going to do is think of it as a big thing, before we shrink it down, so we can look in it and not get confused by the geometry. So that top surface there, the, which is a crooked surface, is some, is some way-tipped surface, uh, some crooked thing up here, has some force on it. And we want to figure out what that force is and what its components are. Well, what we can do is there is some angle that we could look at this surface, which is the side view. It's not the x direction necessarily. It's not the y direction. It's some direction which is looking along the level lines of the surface. So, for example, this surface 
This might be a level line of the surface. So there's some direction which is orthogonal to the level line, and we can be looking in along that level line. So there's a most sloped direction to the surface, and we can look in sideways along in that most sloped direction. When we do that, what we see is a surface like this that's got some angle theta. So what do we mean by theta? When I wrote cosine theta divided by cosine theta, I meant the angle of that surface relative to it being exactly horizontal. Now what do I mean really? I mean the angle between that surface and a vertical line minus 90 degrees. So it's how tipped it is relative to horizontal, not tipped relative to the x-axis or the y-axis. Okay, so this is this stripe here looking in from the side like that, and here is that surface, and then here is uh, that force that we're interested in, and now this force is not this whole force, it's just a little piece of that force, so this delta F we're going to divide into little pieces like this. So that same French fry we can, draw, we, can, we can cut into little slabs if we like. Or we don't even have to cut it into slabs. What we're going to just figure out is the force on this surface by first cutting it into strips like this. Okay, so now this has a little area, which is the width of this thing and the length of this thing. So this has some little length. I'll just call it some, some letter I haven't used yet. I'll call it what? L. Don't I use L all, all, all over the place? Q. Q. Call this Q. And I'll call this uh, U. Okay, this is the length and width of that little strip. So this force here, this little delta F, and this is not the whole delta F, this is just delta F star, it's just some little piece of that delta F, is equal to Q times U, is pointed in the minus direction, and is proportional to the pressure, and is po po pointed in the direction normal to the surface. So the direction of this, the normal to this little strip, is still the normal to this big end of this french fry. Okay, now the question is, how big is this strip? Well, this Q, if we like, has a projection down to another strip, which is orthogonal to the French fry. So this has a projection in this direction, which is different from this. And if this length here I called Q, then this length here, which is a projection of this strip onto an orthogonal cut, on the French fry is Q cosine theta. So there is a strip down here, which is this one, and the area of that uh, strip is equal to Q U uh, cosine theta. Wait, so that, that triangle that you just drew is uh, UY. Is that true? Is what? Like, if it had width out of the board, it would be UY, right? The width out of the board would just be U. Okay. It's not the whole top. It's just, it's just not the width. It's just the width of this little strip here. So this is just the little strip, the little strip. <laughs> and then I cover the lips. All right. So yeah. Okay, so now this thing is bigger than this by the ratio of 1 over cosine theta. Okay. Now, we look at this delta F star, and we're interested in this vertical component of this delta F star. And what is the vertical component of it? Well, here's the theta. So this vertical component is this delta F star. Let's just look at the magnitude of it, not the direction. And that's not a minus sign, that's just saying this thing. Multiplied by its projection in this direction, which is cosine theta. So the force on this thing is proportional to the pressure times this area, divided by cosine theta, because this area is bigger, multiplied by cosine theta because of this projection. So the vertical component of the force
is this Q. Uh, and I'm going to call this Q prime times U times the pressure times, now we have this times and divide by cosine theta. It's divided by cosine theta because the area over which it acts is bigger. It's multiplied by cosine theta because we're only looking at the projection. Yes? Okay, so uh, my question is, are the thetas the same? Are the thetas the same? The top theta and the bottom theta? The two thetas you just drew out. Every theta I drew is the same as every other theta. But the vectors are in different directions. They are. So here's a theta here, but also here's a theta here. This is a vertical. So the, the surface has an orientation of theta relative to the horizontal. And the normal to the surface has an orientation theta relative to the vertical. Why is there a apostrophe after Q? This is a Q prime, which is the length of this strip projected onto the square cut on the top of the french fry. If we take like the slanting surface, like the one which is inclined by theta, then like the height will change at every point. So the pressure will change at every point. That's true. Like we are taking only one height. OK, so this is the nature of calculus which is that this is such a, this french fry, I drew it here kind of small, and then I drew it over there bigger, and then I drew the top of it over there bigger, but what we have here is pressure over here varying in a continuous way, and we're going to take a little french fry that's so small that the difference between this pressure and this pressure is one that we could ignore. And that's just like when you do all of integration, for example, if you want to add up the area under this curve, you can divide it up into a Riemann sum, and you look at this rectangle here, and this rectangle, and we look at the Riemann sum as the sum of the areas in this rectangle, and even though the height of the function here is not the same as the height of the function here, it doesn't matter which one we use, because in the end we're going to take a limiting process and take these smaller and smaller. In the end we're going to think of a limiting process of this smaller and smaller, so we think of this pressure as being constant over this top, even though it's different for this top and this top. So this is the way you do calculus. You divide things into little pieces where you think of things, the functions that are, are smooth, so various functions you think of as constant over that little piece. Now it's got a little area here, it doesn't have a little length, so it's not constant over this piece. Does that answer your question? Okay, so the vertical component of the force on this little strip on the top of this french fry is equal to the projected area of this strip onto an orthogonal cut on the french fry, onto a cut which is uh, just orthogonal to the surface here, multiplied by the pressure. So if you had taken the french fry and put a horizontal cut here, you'd say the downwards force is the pressure times the area. On a crooked cut, the force is bigger, but it's in the wrong direction, and those two effects cancel. And the net vertical component of the force, not the horizontal, there's one left over, the net vertical component is the pressure times the area of the cross section, not the area of this crooked surface. Yes? Say again? This says that the vertical force on this strip, that's the vertical component of the force on this strip, this thing here, is equal to the area of the projection of that strip onto a horizontal cut on the french fry. That's the Q prime times U, multiplied by the pressure, and then corrected for the fact that the actual force is bigger because the surface, that crooked strip, has a bigger area. That's this 1 over cosine theta, and corrected again for the fact that we're only looking at the vertical project projection of that force, which gives us this cosine theta. And these cancel. Okay. Now we can add this up over all of these strips. And it says that the vertical component of the force on the top of the french fry is equal to the pressure times the cross-sectional area of the french fry. Now that's true also on the bottom. But the difference of the pressures is the weight of the fluid. 
Therefore, the difference of the, the net force of those pressures is the weight of the fluid added up over all the French fries. It gives the Archimedes principle. But the hard part of the argument is over there. C content with that? Yes, no? All in favor of yes, content? Raise your hand. Not content? You're not content or discontent? Oh, sorry. Which one are you, content or discontent? Content. Okay, good. Who said they were discontent? Can you, s yes? Why? I have one more question. Yeah? Um, force equals, no, pressure equals force over area. So then you multiply the area by the pressure. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me what the pressure and the area were so that you got that resulting force? This force here, the pressure is this P. That's the pressure acting on this surface here. What's the area? It's the area of this strip up here. Which is in terms of those variables. The area of that up, upper strip up there is the area of its projection divided by cosine theta. These two areas and the ratio of cosine theta to 1. Or 1 to cosine theta. Which is QU cosine theta? Or? That's correct. It's QU, QU divided by Q prime U, which is 1 over cosine theta. <coughs> yes? Why is it starting to include a cosine theta over cosine theta? Say again? Why is the cosine theta over cosine theta necessary in that expression? Why is it necessary? You mean because it's equal to 1? Well, I could just write down the answer. I'm trying to show you the reason. It came from the fact that if we took the air, we're looking at pressure times area and then projection. Pressure times area is P times U times Q. But I put a Q prime here, and if I put a Q prime here, I have to put Q prime over cosine theta to give us Q. Q prime. Is related to Q coat. Right, so I want to put Q U P, that's the size of the force, and that's Q prime U P divided by cosine theta. But that's not the right direction. We now want to look at the projection of that in the correct direction, and the projection takes us this force and multiplies by another cosine theta. So the reason I wrote cosine theta over cosine theta here is I took a force and did the projection, and the two cosine thetas canceled. Does that answer your question? What? Okay, so I guess what you could do is try it yourself again. Draw it, try the homework again yourself, draw it slowly and try and convince yourself of it again. Or come to office hours or ask me now here again. <laughs> or fire me and get a more clear professor or something. Yeah? Right, so this is, this is the projection onto the orthogonal cut of the french fry. So this is the thing which will help us figure out the volume of the french fry. Because the volume of the french fry is going to be this thing multiplied by the height, added up over all those strips of the french fry. So why does your formula for area on top of the cosine Right up here? Yeah. This Q is equal to Q prime over cosine theta. More or less. Okay, so now, if you take 192, you'll learn vector calculus. And there are very tidy, quick ways of doing this derivation using divergence theorem. But they're not intuitive. So you can do that. You'll learn how to do this. It will be a homework problem. At least it will guarantee it's in the book. Uh, but you, you'll look at it, and it will just be a formula. It doesn't, it doesn't give you this intuition about the area is bigger, but the projections, so they cancel. So I, I prefer this derivation myself to the vector calculus one, which you will be able to do at the end of 192. Moving on. OK. So 
uh, I wanted to do just a calculus problem, which is what's the volume of a sphere? In order to do the homework correctly, you had to know the volume of a part of a sphere. It's not satisfying to me that you would look up the volume of part of a sphere on the internet or somewhere or from some handout from the TA. You should be able to figure out the volume of part of a sphere. So that's part of the challenge is to go and figure out what's the volume of a sphere. That's part of what you should, should have uh, banged your head against the wall and worked on, and I will do that for you. But before that, I want to do this demo. So the demo is we have this thing floating in here. And then we pour onto this thing uh, another fluid. And this fluid is lighter than the bottom one, so it floats on top and it presses down on this thing. And how far does it push this down? Okay, now how many people think it makes it go down at all? How many people think it makes it go up? And how many people think it doesn't do anything? And how many people did an experiment? Okay, now this experiment is harder to do than the, uh, than the one uh, with the ice cube because you have to get the right combination of things. So here is a sphere. Uh, can the people in between the camera and uh, the, exactly. <laughs> Okay, now, so you can see the water a little better. We put in some food coloring. Uh, using the... Okay, that's water. Now, I do not have a thing with half the density and half the density. I just had to use what I could find around, which was this baby oil which nobody in my family likes to use because it's scented and makes us all sneeze. But it is lighter than water. It's just not a quarter of the density of water. So to do this experiment, I had to weight this cork with magnets so that it barely floats. So I want something that floats in the water but sinks in the oil, but the oil's not that much lighter than the water, so I have to make it so it barely floats in the water. So I put this cork in. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to trust any. You're not going to trust anything I do ever again, are you? <laughs> okay. So the thing is, is so if you apply the right forces from your fingertips, just the right way, you can make it sink, and then okay. So, uh, you do it on that red thing. That looks metal too. <laughs> well, the, the black part of it. The glass on top. How about this? Will this work? Okay, so here we have this thing. And now there's this top surface which is exposed. And I'm going to press down on that top surface by pouring oil on top. Now, by pouring oil on top, certainly there will be a pressure pressing down on the top surface. So, certainly it will make the cork go down. You can see it all clearly. Uh, clear to everybody? Okay, so I'm going to press down on the top of the cork and then watch the cork go down. But wait, wait, wait something's all messed up here. <laughs> okay, so, so I can't reproduce that. I didn't bring pictures of oil and stuff like that. The cork was barely floating. I poured oil on top, which pressed down on the top of the cork and because down is up and the gravity field is down if you change the reference frame that way but you think the opposite of up is down and then you take into account the psychological effects the cork goes <laughs> up. Okay, so why, why didn't the cork go down? Just, you could say, well, Archimedes' principle says that when this thing is floating it floats so that it's the buoyant force is the weight of the displaced fluid. When it was in air, it had to displace lots of water. But now that there's oil available, it's the weight of the water plus the oil has to equal the weight of the cork. And so it can go up. Okay, that's, that's if you trust Archimedes' principle. Now let's, now, 
that involves trusting Archimedes' principle. But what if we think about pressure forces and so on? The oil came in and pressed the top of the cork down. How come it went up when we pressed down on it? Be yes? It's also pressing on the water. The oil is also pressing on the water. So when I poured the oil in, the pressure of all of this water went up. And therefore, the pressure, for example, on the bottom of the cork increased also. So the pressure on the top of the cork increased and the pressure on the bottom increased. Okay. So there we have the cork uh, floating in the oil. Now to actually do a quantitative calculation, next you have to, what happened? Oh yeah. <laughs> I have this whole list of like classroom demos that screw up. And uh, this one at least I did before class, but I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't anticipate this exactly. <laughs> Okay, Archimedes' derivation of Archimedes' principle did not use the vector calculus I did over here. His derivation went like this. When something is a ball, say, is it submerged in a fluid, there are pressure forces on the edge of this ball and they add up to something. Those pressure forces are the same as they would have been if instead of drawing my wooden ball here, my cork, my boat, whatever it is, I put a blob of fluid here. The water on the outside doesn't know whether there's a boat here or an ice cube or a cork or a ball or what. So the pressure forces on this boat, ball, ice cube, whatever, are the same as what would have been acting on the water. But the water was in equilibrium. So the pressure forces on this thing are the same as the pressure forces that would have acted on the water here, had it been there. But the water is in equilibrium, so the downward force on the water from gravity has to equal the pressure force up. So the pressure forces have to equal the gravity forces on the water that would have been there. So the Archimedes argument, the, more, the classical simpler argument is that when you replace the water with a ball, the water doesn't know the difference. So the pressure forces add up to what they were before, which was enough to hold up the water that was there. And that's the simple derivation of Archimedes' principle, the one that you can explain. It's, it's not like, it's trivial. It takes, I think if you want to think about it, it takes a few minutes to get it. <coughs> Do it with your feet, and then I won't see. You can kick each other, don't, don't like. <laughs> okay. Um, is that clear? Okay, now to do the actual calculation to figure out what's the weight of the displaced fluid, we have to figure out where to put this ball so that the weight of oil plus the weight of water equals the weight of the ball. And in order to do that, we have to know the volume of a, of a truncated sphere. And how do you find the volume of a truncated sphere? Well, you can look for it on the internet. You can look at it. You can get your email from your TA. Or you can say, wait, I know calculus. And you can figure it out yourself. OK, so how does that, how does that derivation go? We want to figure out say the volume of a piece of sphere like that. We can. Once, if we can do the upper half, we can get the lower half. Now, who succeeded in doing this calculus problem? Who did not succeed? Okay, so let me, let me just try to do this calculus problem for you. Uh, well, what, wait a second. Class is technically over. I think I'll just save it so I'm not rushed. So next time we'll go on to heat flow and differential equations. <laughs>